The body style was very similar to this, but Jerry was so gang heavy and so out of whack that Jerry couldn't play it because it, it didn't, didn't stay balanced, okay? And this guitar weighs 13 and a half pounds or more, and that's a heavy guitar. Now, Jerry was a pretty beefy guy in those days. He was strong. He was very strong. As a matter of fact, he blew my mind one time because in those days, the people would come, you know, they were so high on acid when we played shows, they would just, be, you'd see them coming from the audience, you know, we had to spend almost a whole show grabbing people that were stoned out of their gore, and they would try to grab the musicians, we tried to keep them from doing that, you know, and uh, one day a guy was running right toward Jerry, I was trying to get there as quick as I could, and this wasn't this guitar, it was another guitar, Jerry just was playing and he just bam, hit the guy right in the solar plexus and he backed him off, you know, and um, then, a little later that evening, you know, you'd find a guy, he would be holding on to Pigpen's organ, and we were strong guys, and we couldn't pry him off of there, you know. They would turn and say something to you like, uh, I am time, don't fuck with me. <laughs> well, you, you're time? You know, I don't want to tell you how we got him off of there, but, um, so anyway, we were pretty rough and tumble, but Doug was a craftsman, you know. And we were all learning lots of stuff. We learned about guitars, we learned about amps, we were building everything ourselves. And so these guitars started being built by Doug. He builds that one for Jerry, and it just didn't work. Ramrod took the um, guitar, and he cut in a little plate on it, and he filled it with lead and weights, and he tried to balance it out. And that guitar just never worked. But Jerry really liked the way Doug built guitars, and so, he asked him to build another guitar, and he gave that one to Ramrod. He, that guitar later went for auction. His son put it up, so uh, it sold a couple years ago. Um, the Wolf came next, and we got that in 72, in the spring, right before we went to Europe in 72. Now, Jerry was playing at that time a Stratocaster. That's all he really liked at that time, a Stratocaster. And he was playing a Stratocaster that he got from uh, Graham Nash, which we talked about earlier. And Doug built the Wolf, and the Wolf was very similar body style, very interesting uh, features on it. Some of the same stuff with the pickups, because Doug would come and sit with us, and Jerry would tell him his ideas, and what he wanted was a guitar that was more versatile than we ever really did use it for. In other words, Jerry wanted to, hey, what if we want to change the pickups between every song or something? Yeah, let's figure out a way to pull them out. But it never worked like that, of course. Once he found a set that worked, and he set them, he liked to leave them like that. He didn't fuck with his guitars, and he, I, I realized after a few years that he didn't really change them that much. You know, some guys would have a whole stack of guitars to play a show, each song would be a different one, but he stuck to one guitar a lot, and uh, he would change only when he was inspired to change. So when Wolf came to us, he looked at it, he was playing the Strat, he said, well, we'll take it with us to Europe and we'll see if I play it. So what we did while we were there in Europe, we tried playing it a couple of times. In England, uh, uh, he tried at Wembley Pool, but it didn't feel right. After one song, he switched back to the Strat. So we kind of put it away. It was giving us a problem where it was breaking E strings down here. Same thing, this guitar. It, it was like Irwin was so much like a clockwork maker, he made the same tiny mistakes on this guitar that he made on that one. But he was a perfectionist. Uh, I pointed out earlier on this guitar right here, just to show you his skill at inlay. Of course, this was his insignia with the eagle and the whirl. And I was showing people where he showed me when he brought this guitar to us. Originally, he had nothing up here. But he took his little saw, and he would sit there for hours, and he would collect mother-of-pearl abalone shells, and he would himself chip them until he got the right pieces and the right color. And if you look at this world, you see something that is true craftsmanship. His necks were the finest in the world, and his fretboards were incredible. He spent so much time finding the right piece of wood. Now let's talk about the wood of this guitar for a minute, and we'll go back to the wool for a second. This guitar is made of Coca-Cola wood. One of the hardest woods in the world. It can't be sawed, it can't be hacked, it can't be knocked down. You cannot knock it down. Only God or nature knocks the trees down. 
And as Doug explained to me, they were then dragged into trading posts and would somehow find their way to find arts, wood people. And when he was making this guitar and the wolf guitar, because the wolf guitar had purple heart, another dangerous South American wood in it. And if he went down there when he was working on building the wolf, he would yell at you, he put a mask on you, or we all had bandanas, we wrap around our mouth, because when he was cutting the neck or sawing, he just, this, this dust that was coming off it was toxic. Because in, in the jungle where these woods came from, they had to be insect proof, or they wouldn't last and termites. So this Coca-Cola wood is so tough and so hard, and it, it made the guitar heavy to start with. Then Doug did a, a thing that I'd never seen before and none of us ever had. And he started it on Wolf too. He would do these laminations. There is a whole brass piece that completely shapes this on both sides. It goes all the way across and fits, um, you know, as a lamination. Sam was standing with bird's eye maple here. And then things like this that people never noticed. That's uh, the serial number right there of the guitar and this little, what I call the tree of life, I always called it. And, you know, I almost started crying when, when Jake, I, I saw he was bringing this guitar back because uh, in The Grateful Dead, in, Ramrod was a great teacher and he taught me, he said, what things do you, he said to me, you know, because I, Jerry and I basically started the Jerry Garcia band by playing with Howard Wales, who called me and heard me today by chance and we talked to him. Um, uh, that started the Jerry Garcia band playing with Khan and, and um, Howard, <laughs> excuse me, Howard Wales at the Matrix. And so um, Jerry would always come in at one o'clock in the afternoon. One o'clock in the afternoon, he wanted his amp. So when Ramrod said to me, he said, Steve, would you take Jerry's guitar and would you take his amp to the Matrix tonight? We're standing in front of the studio at two at night. I said, sure I would. I had a 51 Cadillac that I bought from Ramrod for 100 bucks. It was a beautiful piece of Cadillac. A Cadillac. I opened the trunk and I put the twin in there, Jerry's uh, strap, and we went over to the Matrix and banged on the door. The guy just couldn't believe we were there that early, you know. And so at that point, Jerry started teaching me about his instrument and his amplifier and how to deal with it. He was a great teacher. And any good roadie will tell you this, you know, that you are only as good as your musician can teach you to be. And you can be better than him sometimes, but you can't be better than him all the time, I'll tell you that. Like, in other words, you don't want to point out some simple thing to him that you think would be right for him. And Jerry was very particular about his guitar. But he trusted us to take care of him, and he basically, uh, between Ramar and I, he said to me, you know, we can never look at Jerry. How are we ever going to tell him we lost his guitar? Or any of his guitars, or any guitar. And I'm proud to say it was only one guitar, one of your dad's basses one time, actually, uh, that got um, disappeared in L.A. at the show. We never lost another <laughs> We did lose a, a, a Martin guitar at, in Hamburg, Germany, but I think that's because he threw his telephone out the window. And, smash that place up and Kreutzmann, there was a, a mirror at the hotel that was from 1840 that survived both world wars in Germany, but it didn't survive Bill Kreutzmann. <laughs> <laughs> he got refused service at the bar and he decided to start World War II over again. And they were pretty pissed off that that antique mirror got busted. And so I think that's why we lost that guitar. But anyway, we weren't ever going to lose another one. So I literally slept with this thing, and when I saw a picture today of your dad holding it, I realized something. All of a sudden, it dawned on me: he never touched that guitar, and neither did Bobby, and neither did anybody but Jerry or me, and and Doug. But Doug was so crazy, and he was so nuts, and so I couldn't even tell you all the drugs he was addicted to. And one time, what he would do, he he, he was so messed up, he couldn't drive. He would take the bus to the studio when we called him, and it was a real, uh, to let it go in his hands was the hardest thing for me to do. But he was the maker of it, and he knew better than to try to shake us. We'd have found him wherever he went. But uh, he was so messed up that his personal life was a, was a, a horrible, um, freakish thing. And he, he left a lemon by this time when he built his guitar. He was independent. And, <laughs> 
Uh, I'm not kidding you. Uh, well, when I came to get this guitar one day, he was having a fight with his girlfriend, and I told these guys earlier, she threw a, can, a, a cup of gasoline on him and threw a match and lit him on fire. And then he, he put himself out at the garden hose and then lit her on fire. So we, I never brought the guitar back to him again. <laughs> and he, then that's when uh, I remember for this guitar, I found Gary uh, in the city here. I found a guy to repair it, and that was so good because I could sit right there with him. But we didn't. Saturday and Chatham? Huh? Saturday and Chatham? No, Saturday and Chatham was way before that. No, um, that was a place on Ellis, right? right? Yeah, we went there for guitar stuff for years. But uh, they were so old fashioned, no, they couldn't deal with guitar like this. But, um, this was not an electric guitar. It was not, uh, if anybody tells you ever that anybody else put any electronics in here besides Grateful Dead, they're wrong because nobody else did. Now, the reason for the two holes, as I was explaining earlier, was something that Jerry invented himself, the two jacks, because he uh, never played with uh, pedals until around 1971, late in the year. We were doing a Jerry Garcia band show with Merle Saunders over at the Keystone on Stockton and Vallejo. And he said, Steve, you know what? I, I want to try a wild one pedal. First time ever. And so I went down to Don Weir and bought uh, a Foxy Lady Jimi Hendrix wah wah pedal. But once he realized that, you know, when you plug your guitar into a pedal and it still happens to you, and then you go into your amp, you lose volume immediately when you click into that pedal, and he hated that. So he came up with this idea all himself as he started adding a few more pedals, because he didn't use a lot of pedals to start with. And, um, Cameron was telling me that, he, you know, we, it was a mystery how it worked exactly, but the basic idea was that the signal went from here, when he switched this down, it would go from here into the pedal, back into the guitar, and back out to the amp, right? Thinking that was pretty simple, but nobody else had ever thought of it, you know? This one being a stereo jack, this one being a mono jack, was part of the Seagrill, but... We had some really great guys. Now, Dan Healy was an amazing Fender guy. He could repair Fender amps. He taught us all how to run twins and how to run all Fender equipment. And so, basically, Jerry was a Fender man to his bone, deep inside. And it worked so good, his idea that he kept it forever on all his guitars uh, and changed it over to that system. Now, under here was all a hollow compartment, and Doug had no idea what was going to happen with that as things went on. Because Jerry had an idea. What he wanted was some sort of an apparatus design that when he broke a string, we could hit a button somewhere and a new string would pop up out of here if we could figure this out. Then he could just pull it up and start tuning it and he, when he broke the string on stage. And that's what we came up with. Uh, actually, I don't think, I've never seen anybody else do it. I'm sure they had, but Ramrod and I, came up with the system of changing the string of the group on stage while he was playing. And he, he loved it, but when he, when he broke the string and he came out there to fix it or anything in his stuff, he would crank up as loud as he could just so he could deafen you for life, you know, <laughs> and punish you in some way for that. And Jerry was a great guy, man, but when his stuff broke, he wasn't saying happy birthday to you when he came out there to fix it. So he was very particular about that. He, he really throws you off when anything happens with your gear. This guitar, when we got it working right, was a dream to work with. These knobs, Doug Irwin refined everything. We thought, somebody mentioned earlier, they might be broadcasting knobs. They're not. They're custom knobs of some type that Doug would find somewhere. And he put them on there, and they've been on there all those years. Um, this switch, was, of course, is just like a scratch and switch in the pickup position. Um, so many places that we played over the years, you know, they had so many weird buzzes in them and horrible stuff that we would go so far as to do everything we took to change the whole place because that's where the pickups pick up so much noise of uh, lights and everything else and putting out any kind of electrical ambiance that's picked up by a guitar. This guitar was particularly quiet because of all the things we learned. We would take every guitar, and I don't know, do you still do this guitar? We painted everything with uh, copper. copper paint and silver paint. Every inch of it inside there. So there would be a whole 
the whole thing, that we, anywhere we could get that in there. And that helped a lot. So this guitar was an accumulation of what we learned from all the early guitars before that. And like I say, it was Wolf and an unnamed one, which we just called Heavy. And Doug, when we read Europe, and Jerry had Wolf with him, he was playing the Stratocaster most of the time. And like I say, he said, take it with us. And we'll work on it out there, Steve. And so we would play and sit in the afternoon and he'd say, bring the wolf out. He didn't call the wolf then. We just said, bring your own guitar out. And we'd start tweaking on it. He would start adjusting the saddle, start to make it his in every way. Just every pickup, notch, and everything in it. And uh, Sonny Heard, who was on our crew at the time, and he only made it by the skin of his teeth, but that's another story. But anyway, he came and walking in and he had all these stickers that he bought. They were so beautiful. He stuck the alligator on the um, Stratocaster, the 58 Strat, that Jerry got from uh, Graham Nash. And on Wolf, he put the uh, Tex Avery Wolf sticker. When we got back, to the States after that tour, and Jerry realized a couple of things before he tweaked in, and I had to give it back to Doug. He blew our mind, and he came back, and he'd taken that little sticker, and he had inlaid it to the finest example of inlay you could imagine. And that became uh, a thing, that's why the tiger was his thing on here. Now, if you ever look at this tiger, you've all seen this tiger a billion times. Have you ever eat, anybody here ever eat Chinese food? <laughs> And we always see it in every Chinese restaurant in the world. I always see this tiger. Because Doug, I only I can tell. I said, Doug, that's the Chinese tiger right off the, the menu, right off the uh, calendar that you get in those days. And it is. It's the tiger looking up at the dragon in the sky. Check it out yourself. But that's exactly what he got it from. And, you know, he was that kind of guy that borrowed those kind of things and arts like that. 